Chapter One of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Chapter One Series Runaway. One can hardly be dull possessing the pleasant imaginary picture of a municipality hot in chase of a wild crop, at least while the charming quarry escapes, as it does in Rome. The municipality does not exist that would be nimble enough to overtake the Roman growth of green in the high places of the city. It is true that there have been famous captures, those in the Colosseum, and in the baths of caracula moreover a less conspicuous running to earth takes place on the apian way in some miles of the solitude of the campagna where men are employed in weeding the roadside they slowly uproot the grass and lay it on the ancient stones rows of little corpses for sweeping up as at upper tooting one wonders why the governors of the city will not succeed in making the via appia look busy or its striped stones suggestive of thriving commerce again at the cemetery within the now torn and shattered aurelian wall by the porta san paolo they are often mowing of buttercups a light of laughing flowers along the grass is spread says shelley whose child lies between keats and the pyramid but a couple of active scythes are kept at work there summer and spring not that the grass is long for it is much overtopped by the bee orchis but because flowers are not to laugh within reach of the civic vigilance yet except that it is overtaken and put to death in these accessible places the wild summer growth of rome has a prevailing success and victory it breaks all bounds flies to the summits lodges in the sun swings in the wind takes wing to find the remotest ledges and blooms aloft it makes light of the sixteenth century of the seventeenth and of the eighteenth as the historic ages grow cold it banters them alike the flagrant flourishing statue the haughty facade the broken pediment and rome is chiefly the city of the broken pediment are the opportunities of this vagrant garden in the air one certain church that is full of attitude can hardly be aware that a crimson snapdragon of great stature and many stalks and blossoms is standing on its furthest summit tiptoe against its sky the cornice of another church in the fair middle of rome lifts out of the shadows of the streets a row of accidental marigolds impartial to the antique the medieval the renaissance early and late the newer modern this wild summer finds its account in travertine and tufa reticulated work brick stucco and stone a bird of the air carries the matter or the last sea wind sombre and soft of the latest tramontana gold and blue has lodged in a little fertile dust the wild grass wild wheat wild oats if venus had her run away after whom the elizabethans raised hue and cry this is circe's the municipal authorities hot foot cannot catch it and worst than of all if they pause dismayed to mark the flight of the agile fugitives safe on the ark of a flying buttress or taking the place of the fallen mosaics and colored tiles of a twelfth century tower and in any case inaccessible the grass grows under their discomfited feet it actually casts a flush of green over their city piazza the wide light gray pavement so vast that to keep them weeded would need an army of workers that army has not been employed and grass grows in a small way but still beautifully in the wide space around which the tramway circles perhaps a hatred of its delightful presence is what chiefly prompts the civic government in rome to the effort to turn the piazza into a square the shrub is to take the place not so much of the pavement as of the importunate grass for it is hard to be beaten and the weed does so prevail 
is so small and so dominant the sun takes its part and one might almost imagine a sensitive municipality in tears to see grass running overhead and underfoot through the third which is in truth the fourth rome when i say grass i use the word widely italian grass is not turf it is full of things and they are chiefly aromatic no richer scents throng each other close and warm than these from a little hand space of the grass one rests on within the walls or on the plain or in the sabine or the alban hills moreover under the name i will take leave to include lettuce as it grows with a most welcome surprise on certain ledges of the vatican that great and beautiful palace is piled at various angles as it were house upon house here magnificent here careless but with nothing pretentious and nothing furtive and outside one lateral window on a ledge to the sun prospers this little garden of random salad buckingham palace has nothing whatever of the vatican dignity but one cannot well think of little cheerful cabbages sunning themselves on any parapet it may have round a corner moreover in italy the vegetables the table ones have a wildness a suggestion of the grass from lands at liberty for all the tilling wildish peas wilder asparagus the field asparagus which seems to have disappeared from england but of which henrik boasts in his manifestations of frugality and strawberries much less than half way from the small and darkling ones of the woods to the pale and corpulent of the gardens and with nothing of the wild fragrance lost these are all italian things of savage savour and simplicity the most cultivated of all countries the italy of tillage is yet not a garden but something better as her city is yet not a town but something better and her wilderness something better than a desert in all the three there is a trace of the little flying heels of the runaway end of chapter one chapter two of series runaway and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell A Vanquished Man Hayden died by his own act in 1846, and it was not in the event until 1853 that his journal was edited, not by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, as he wished, but by Tom Taylor turning over these familiar and famous volumes often read i wonder once more how any editor was bold to take upon himself the mystery of things in the case of hayden and to assign to that venial moral fault or this the ill fortune and defeat that beset him with hardly a pause for the renewal of the resistance of his admirable courage that he made a mere intellectual mistake gave thanks with a lowly and lofty heart for a genius denied him that he prepared himself to answer to heaven and earth for the gift he had not to suffer its reproach to bear its burden and that he looked for its reward is all his history there was no fault of the intellect in his apprehension of the thing he thought to stand possessed of he conceived it aright and he was just in his rebuke of a world so dull and trivial before the art for which he died he esteemed it aright except when he deemed it his his editor thinking himself to be summoned to justify the chastisement the destruction the whole retribution of such a career looks here and there for the sins of hayden the search is rewarded with the discovery of faults such as every man and woman entrust to the common generosity the general consciousness it is a pity to see any man conning such offences by heart and setting them clear in an editorial judgment because he thinks himself to hold a trust by virtue of his biographical office to explain the sufferings and the failure of a conquered man 
what in the end are the sins which are to lead the reader sad but satisfied to conclude with see the result of or so it must ever be with him who yields to or whatever else may be the manner of ratifying the sentence on the condemned and dead hayden we hear omitted to ask advice or if he asked it did not shape his course thereby unless it pleased him hayden was self-willed he had a wild vanity and he hoped he could persuade all the powers that include the powers of man to prosper the work of which he himself was sure he did not wait upon the judgment of the world but thought to compel it should he then have waited upon the judgment of such a world he was foremost in the task of instructing nay of compelling it when there was a question of the value of the elgin marbles and when the possession which was the preservation of these was at stake there he was not wrong his judgment that dealt him in his own cause the first the fatal the final injury the initial subtle blow that sent him on his career so wronged so cleft through and through that the mere course and action of life must ruin him this judgment in art directed him in the decision of the most momentous of all public questions hayden admired wrote protested declaimed and fought and in great part it seems we owe our perpetual instruction by those judges of the arts which are the fragments of the elgin sculptures to the fact that hayden trusted himself with the trust that worked his own destruction in the presence especially of those seated figures commonly called the fates we habitually bring our arts for sentence he lent an effectual hand to the setting up of that tribunal of headless stones the thing we should lament is rather that the world which refused neglected forgot him and by chance medley was right was right had no possible authority for anything that it did against him and that he might have sent it to school for all his defect of genius moreover that he was mortally wounded in the last of his forty years of battle by this ironic wound among the bad painters chosen to adorn the houses of parliament with fresco he was not one this affront he took at the hands of men who had no real distinctions in their gift he might well have had by mere chance some great companion with whom to share that rejection the unfortunate man had no such fortuitous fellowship at hand how strange the solitude of the bad painter outcast by the worst and capable of making common cause indomitably with the good had there been any such to take heart from his high courage there was none there were arranged the unjust judges with their blunders all in good order and their ignorance new dressed and there was no artist to destroy except only this one somewhat better than their favoured their appointed painters in fresco one uncompanioned and a man besides through whose heart the public reproach was able to cut keenly is this sensibility to be made a reproach to hayden it has always seemed to me that he was not without greatness yet he was always without dignity in those most cruel passages of his life such as that of his defeat toward the close of his war by the show of a dwarf to which all london thronged led by royal example while the exhibition of his picture was deserted he was not betrayed by anger at this end of hopes and labours in which all that a man lives for had been pledged nay he succeeded in bearing what a more inward man would have taken more hardly he was able to say in his loud voice in reproach to the world what another would have barred within one of his great pictures was in a cellar another in an attic another at the pawnbroker's another in a grocer's shop another unfinished in his studio the bills for frames and colours and the rent were unpaid some solace he even found in stating a few of these facts in french to a french official or a diplomatic visitor to london interested in the condition of the arts well who shall live without support a man finds it where he can after these offences of self-will and vanity tom taylor finds us some other little thing i think it is inaccuracy 
poor hayden says in one phrase that he paid all his friends on such a day and in another soon following that the money given or lent to him had been insufficient to pay them completely and assuredly there are many revisions afterthoughts or other accidents to account for such a slip his editor says the discrepancy is characteristic but i protest i cannot find another like it among these melancholy pages if something graver could be but sifted out from all these journals and letters of frank confession by the explainer here then is the last and least hayden was servile in his address to men of rank but his servility seems to be very much in the fashion of his day nothing grosser and the men who set the fashion had not to shape their style to hayden's perpetual purpose which was to ask for commissions or for money not the forsaken man only but also the fallen city evokes this exercise of historical morality until a man in flourishing london is not afraid to assign the causes of the decay of venice and there is not a watering place upon our coasts but is securely aware of merited misfortune on the adriatic hayden was grateful and he helped men in trouble he had pupils and never a shilling in pay for teaching them he painted a good thing the head of his lazarus he had no fault of theory what fault of theory can a man commit who stands as he did by nature and the greeks in theory he soon outgrew the italians then most admired he had an honest mind but nothing was able to gain for him the pardon that is never to be gained the impossible pardon pardon for that first and last mistake the mistake as to his own powers if to pardon means to dispense from consequence how should this be pardoned art would cease to be itself by such an amnesty End of chapter 2chapter three of a series runaway and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by annie hill circe's runaway and other essays by alice mayno chapter three a northern fancy i remember said dryden writing to dennis i remember poor nat lee who was then upon the verge of madness yet made a sober and witty answer to a bad poet who told him it was an easy thing to write like a madman no said he tis a very difficult thing to write like a madman but tis a very easy thing to write like a fool nevertheless the difficult song of distraction is to be heard a light high note in english poetry throughout two centuries at least and one english poet lately sent that untethered lyric the mad maid song flying again a revolt against the oppression of the late sixteenth and early seventeenth centuries the age of the rediscovery of death against the crime of tragedies against the tyranny of italian example that had made the poets walk in one way of love scorn constancy inconstancy may have caused this trolling of unconsciousness this tune of innocence and this carol of liberty to be held so dear i heard a maid in bedlam runs the old song high and low the poets tried for that note and the singer was nearly always to be a maid and crazed for love except for the temporary insanity so indifferently worn by the soprano of the now deceased kind of italian opera and except that a recent french story plays with the flitting figure of a village girl robbed of her wits by woe and this too is a russian villager and the southern author may have found his story on the spot as he seems to aver i have not met elsewhere than in england this solitary and detached poetry of the treble note astray at least it is principally a northern fancy would the steadfast cordelia if she had not died have lifted the low voice to that high note so delicately untuned 
she who would not be prodigal of words might yet indeed have sung in the cage and told old tales and laughed at gilded butterflies of the court of crimes and lived so long in the strange health of an emancipated brain as to wear out pacts and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon she if king lear had had his last desire might have sung the merry and strange tune of bedlam like the slighter ophelia and the maid called barbara it was surely the name of the maid who died singing as desdemona remembers that lingered in the ears of wordsworth of all the songs of the distracted written in the sanity of high imagination there is nothing more passionate than that beginning tis said that some have died for love to one who has always recognized the greatness of this poem and who possibly had known and forgotten how much ruskin prized it it was a pleasure to find the judgment afresh in modern painters where this grave lyric is cited for an example of great imagination it is the mourning and restless song of the lover the pretty barbara died who has not yet broken free from memory into the alien world of the insane barbara's lover dwelt in the scene of his love as dryden's adam entreats the expelling angel that he might do protesting that he could endure to lose the bliss but not the place and although this dramatic paradise lost of dryden's is hardly named by critics except to be scorned this is assuredly a fine and imaginative thought it is nevertheless as a wanderer that the crazed creature visits the fancy of english poets with such a wild recurrence the englishmen of the far past barred by climate bad roads ill-lighted winters and the intricate life and customs of the little town must have been generally a homekeeper no adventure no setting forth and small liberty for him but tom a bedlam the wild man in patches or in ribbons with his wallet and his horn for alms of food or drink came and went as fitfully as the storm free to suffer all the cold an unsheltered creature and the chilly fancy of the villager followed him out to the heath on a journey that had no law was it he in person or a poet for him that made the swinging song from the hag and the hungry goblin if a poet it was one who wrote like a madman and not like a fool not a town not a village not a solitary cottage during the english middle ages was unvisited by him who frightened the children they had a name for him as for the wild birds robin redbreast dicky swallow philip sparrow tom tit tom a bedlam and after him came the abram men who were sane parodies of the crazed and went to the fairs and wakes in motley evelyn says of a fop all his body was dressed like a maypole or a tom a bedlam's cap but after the civil wars they vanished and no man knew how in time old men remembered them only to remember that they had not seen any such companies or solitary wanderers of late years the mad maid of the poets is a vagrant too when she is free and not singing with bedlam early in the morning in the spring wordsworth who dealt with the legendary fancy in his ruth makes the crazed one a wanderer in the hills whom a traveller might see by chance rare as an oread and nearly as wild as echo herself i too have passed her in the hills setting her little water mills his heart misgives him to think of the rheumatism that must befall in such a way of living and his grave sense of civilization bourgeois in the humane and noble way that is his own restores her after death to the company of man to the holy bell which shakespeare's duke remembered in banishment and to the congregation and their christian psalm the older poets were less responsible less serious and more sad than wordsworth when they in turn were touched by the fancy of the maid crazed by love 
they left her to her light immortality and she might be drenched in dews they would not desire to reconcile nor bury her she might have her hair torn by the bramble but her heart was light after trouble many light hearts and wings she had at least the bird's heart and the poet lent to her voice the wings of his verses there is nothing in our poetry less modern than she the vagrant woman of latter feeling was rather the sane creature of ebenezer elliot's fine lines in the excursion bone weary many childed trouble tried wife of my bosom wedded to my soul trouble did not try the elizabethan wild one it undid her she had no child or if there had ever been a child of hers she had long forgotten how it died she hailed the wayfarer who was more weary than she with a song she haunted the cheerful dawn her good morrow rings from herrick's poem fresh as a cock crow she knows that her love is dead and her perplexity has regard rather to the many kinds of flowers than to the old story of his death they distract her in the splendid meadows all the tragic world paused to hear that lightest of songs as the tragedy of hamlet pauses for the fitful voice of ophelia strange was the charm of this perpetual alien and unknown to us now the world has become once again as it was in the mad maid's heyday less serious and more sad than wordsworth but it has not recovered and perhaps never will recover that sweetness blake's was a more starry madness crabb writing of village sorrows thought himself bound to recur to the legend of the mad maid but his crazed maiden is sane enough sorrowful but dull and sings of her own burning brow as herrick's wild one never sang nor is there any smile in her story though she talks of flowers or rather the herbs i loved to rear and perhaps she is the surest of all signs that the strange inspiration of the past centuries was lost vanished like tom a bedlam himself it had been wholly english whereas the english eighteenth century was not holy english it might not be imagined that any hard southern mind could ever have played in poetry with such a fancy or that petrarch for example could so have forgone the manifestation of intelligence and intelligible sentiment and as to dante who put the two eternities into the momentary balance of the human will cold would be his disregard of this northern dream of innocence if the mad maid was an alien upon earth what were she in the inferno what word can express her strangeness there her vagrancy there and with what eyes would they see this dewy face glancing in at the windows of that city End of chapter three Chapter Four of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Chapter Four Laughter. Times have been, it is said, merrier than these but it is certain nevertheless that laughter was never so honoured as now were it not for the paradox one might say it was never so grave everywhere the joke emerges as an elegant writer might have it emerges to catch the attention of the sense of humour and everywhere the sense of humour wanders watches and waits to honour the appeal it loiters vaguely but perpetually willing it wears let the violent personification be pardoned a hanging lip and a wrinkle in abeyance and an eye in suspense it is much at the service of the vagrant encounterer and may be accosted by any chance daughters of the game it stands in untoward places or places that were once inappropriate and is early at some indefinite appointment some ubiquitous tryst with the compliant jest 
all literature becomes a field of easy assignations there is a constant signalling and endless recognition forms of approach are remitted and the joke and the sense of humour with no surprise of meaning or no gaiety of strangeness so customary has the promiscuity become go up and down the pages of the paper and the book see again the theatre a somewhat easy sort of comic acting is by so much the best thing upon our present stage that little else can claim paradox again apart to be taken seriously there is in a word a determination an increasing tendency away from the oriental estimate of laughter as a thing fitter for women fittest for children and unfitted for the beard laughter is everywhere and at every moment proclaimed to be the honourable occupation of men and in some degree distinctive of men and no mean part of their prerogative and privilege the sense of humour is chiefly theirs and those who are not men are to be admitted to the jest upon their explanation they will not refuse explanation and there is little upon which a man will so value himself as upon that sense in england now meanwhile it would be a pity if laughter should ever become like rhetoric and the arts a habit and it is in some sort a habit when it is not inevitable if we ask ourselves why we laugh we must confess that we laugh oftenest because being amused we intend to show that we are amused we are right to make the sign but a smile would be as sure a signal as a laugh and more sincere it would but be changing the convention and the change would restore laughter itself to its own place we have fallen into the way of using it to prove something our sense of goodness of the jest to wit but laughter should not thus be used it should go free it is not a demonstration whether in logic or as the word demonstration is now generally used in emotion and we do ill to charge it with that office something of the oriental idea of dignity might not be amiss among such a people as ourselves containing wide and numerous classes who laugh without cause audiences crowds a great many clergymen who perhaps first fell into the habit in the intention of proving that they were not gloomy but a vast number of laymen also who had not that excuse and many women who laugh in their uncertainty as to what is humorous and what is not this last is the most harmless of all kinds of superfluous laughter when it carries an apology a confession of natural and genial ignorance and when a gentle creature laughs a laugh of hazard and experiment she is to be more than forgiven what she must not do is to laugh a laugh of instruction and as it were retrieve the jest that was never worth the taking there are besides a few women who do not disturb themselves as to a sense of humour but who laugh from a sense of happiness childish is that trick and sweet for children who always laugh because they must and never by way of proof or sign laugh only half their laughs out of their sense of humour they laugh the rest under a mere stimulation because of a bounding breath and blood because someone runs behind them for example and movement does so jog their spirits that their legs fail them for laughter without a jest if ever the day should come when men and women shall be content to signal their perception of humour by the natural smile and shall keep the laugh for its own unpremeditated act shall laugh seldom and simply and not thrice at the same thing once for foolish surprise and twice for tardy intelligence and thrice to let it be known that they are amused then it may be time to persuade this laughing nation not to laugh so loud as it is wont in public the theatre audiences of louder speaking nations laugh lower than ours the laugh that is chiefly a signal of the laughers sense of the ridiculous is necessarily loud and it has the disadvantage of covering what we may perhaps wish to hear from the actors it is a public laugh 
and no ordinary citizen is called upon for a public laugh he may laugh in public but let it be with private laughter there let us if anything like a general reform be possible in these times of dispersion and of scattering keep henceforth our sense of humour in a place better guarded as something worth a measure of seclusion it should not loiter in wait for the alms of a joke in adventurous places for the sense of humour has other things to do than to make itself conspicuous in the act of laughter it has negative tasks of valid virtue for example the standing and waiting within call of tragedy itself where excluded it may keep guard no reasonable man will aver that the oriental manners are best this would be to deny shakespeare as his comrades knew him where the wit outdid the meat outdid the frolic wine and to deny ben jonson's tart aristophanes neat terence witty plautus and the rest doubtless greece determined the custom for all our occident but none the less might the modern world grow more sensible of the value of composure to none other of the several powers of our souls do we so give rein as to this of humour and none other do we indulge with so little fastidiousness it is as though there were honour in governing the other senses and honour in refusing to govern this it is as though we were ashamed of reason here and shy of dignity and suspicious of temperance and diffident of moderation and too eager to thrust forward that which loses nothing by seclusion End of chapter four Chapter Five of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Mayno. Harlequin. Mercutio. The first time that Mercutio fell upon the English stage, there fell with him a gay and hardly human figure. It fell, perhaps finally, for English drama. That manner of man, Arlecchino or Harlequin, had outlived his playmates, Pantaleone, Brigella, Colombina, and the clown. A little of Pantaleone survives in old Capulet, a little in the father of the shrew. But the life of Mercutio in the one play, and of the subordinate Tranio in the other, is less quickly spent, less easily put out, than the smouldering of the old man. Arlecchino frolics in and out of the tragedy and comedy of Shakespeare until he thus dies in his lightest, his brightest, his most vital shape. Arlecchino, the tricksy and shifty spirit, the contriver, the busybody, the trusty rogue, the wonder-worker, the man in disguise, the mercurial one, lives on buoyantly in France to the age of Molière. He is officious and efficacious in the skin of Mascarelli, and Ergast and Scapin pretends to be a lackey, with a reference rather to antiquity in the Latin comedy than to the Middle Ages. As on the English stage, his mere memory survives differently to a later age in the person of Charles, his friend. What convinces me that he virtually died with Mercutio is chiefly this, that this comrade of Romeo's lives so keenly as to be fully capable of the death that he takes a Tybalt's sword-point. He lived indeed, he dies indeed. Another thing that marks the close of a career of ages is his loss of his long customary good luck. Who ever heard of Arlecchino, unfortunate before, at fault with a sword-play, overtaken by tragedy? His time had surely come. 
the gay companion was to bleed. Tybalt's sword had made a way. T'was not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church door, but it served. Some confusion comes to pass among the typical figures of the primitive Italian play, because Harlequin, on that conventional little stage of the past, has a hero's place, whereas when he interferes in human affairs, he is only the auxiliary. He might be lover and bridegroom on the primitive stage, in the comedy of these few and unaltered types. But when Pantaloon, Clown, and Harlequin play with really human beings, then Harlequin can be no more than a friend of the hero, the friend of the bridegroom. The five figures of the old stage dance attendance. They play around the business of those who have the dignity of mortality. They, poor immortals, a clown who does not die, a pantaloon never far from death, who yet does not die, a columbine who never attains Desdemona's death of innocence or Juliet's death of rectitude and passion, flit in the backward places of the stage. Ariel fulfills his office and is not of one kind with those he serves. Is there a memory of Harlequin in that delicate figure? Something of the subservient immortality, of the light and dignity, proper to Pantaleone, Brigella, Arlecchino, Columbina, and the Clown, hovers away from the stage when Ariel's released from the trouble of human things. Immortality, did I say? It was immortality until Mercutio fell. And if some claim be made to it still because Harlequin has transformed so many scenes for the pleasure of so many thousand children since Mercutio died, I must reply that our modern Harlequin is no more than a marionette. He has returned whence he came. A man may play him, but he is, as he was first of all, a doll. From dollhood, Arlecchino took life, and, so promoted, flitted through a thousand comedies, only to be again what he first was, save that, as once a doll played the man, so now a man plays the doll. It is but a memory of Arlecchino that our children see, a poor statue or image endowed with mobility rather than with life. With Mercutio vanished the light heart that had given to the serious ages of the world an hour's refuge from the unforgotten burden of responsible conscience. The light heart assumed, borrowed, made dramatically the spectator's own. We are not serious now, and no heart now is quite light, even for an hour. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Chapter Six The Little Language. Dialect is the elf rather than the genius of place and a dwarfish master of the magic of local things. In England, we hardly know what a concentrated homeliness it nourishes, inasmuch as, with us, the castes and classes for whom Goldoni and Galina and Signor Fogazzaro have written in the patois of the Veneto, use no dialect at all. Neither Goldoni nor Galina has charged the Venetian language with so much literature as to take from the people the shelter of their almost unwritten tongue. Signor Fogazzaro, bringing tragedy into the homes of dialect, does but show us how the language staggers under such a stress, how it breaks down and resigns that office. One of the finest 
of the characters in the ranks of his admirable fiction is that old manageress of the narrow things of the house whose daughter is dying insane i have called the dialect a shelter that it is but the poor old lady does not cower within her resigned head erect she is shut out from that homely refuge suffering and inarticulate the two dramatists in their several centuries also recognized the inability of the dialect they laid none but light loads upon it they caused it to carry no more in their homely plays than it carries in homely life their work leaves it what it was the talk of a people talking much about few things a people like our own and any other in their lack of literature but local and all italian in their lack of silence common speech is surely a greater part of life to such a people than to one less pleased with chatter or more pleased with books i am writing of men women and children and children are not forgotten since we share a patois with children on terms of more than common equality who possess for all occasions of ceremony and opportunities of dignity a general national liberal able and illustrious tongue charged with all its history and all its achievements for the speakers of dialect of a certain rank speak italian too but to tamper with their dialect or to take it from them would be to leave them houseless and exposed in their daily business so much does their patois seem to be their refuge from the heavy and multitudinous experiences of a literary tongue that the stopping of a fox's earth might be taken as the image of any act that should spoil or stop the talk of the associated seclusion of their town and leave them in the bleakness of a larger patriotism the venetian people the genoese and the other speakers of languages that might all have proved right italian had not dante petrarch and boccaccio written in tuscan can neither write nor be taught hard things in their dialect although they can live whether easy lives or hard and evidently can die therein the hands and feet that have served the villager and the citizen at homely tasks have all the lowliness of his patois to his mind and when he must perforce yield up their employment we may believe that it is a simple thing to die in so simple and so narrow a language one so comfortable neighborly tolerant and compassionate so confidential so incapable ignorant unappalling inapt to wing any wearied thought upon difficult flight or to spur it upon hard travelling not without words is mental pain or even physical pain to be undergone but the words that have done no more than order the things of the narrow street are not words to put a fine edge or a piercing point to any human pang it may even well be that to die in dialect is easier than to die in the eloquence of manfred though that declaimed language too is doubtless a defence if one of a different manner these writers in venetian they are named because in no other italian dialect has work so popular as goldoni's been done nor so excellent as signor fogazaro's have left the unlettered local language in which they loved to deal to its proper limitations they have not given weighty things into its charge nor made it heavily responsible they have added nothing to it nay by writing it they might even be said to have made it duller had it not been for the reader and the actor insomuch as the intense expressiveness of a dialect of a small vocabulary in the mouth of a dramatic people lies in the various accent wherewith a southern citizen knows how to enrich his talk it remains for the actor to restore its life to the written phrase in dialect the author is forbidden to search for the word for there is none lurking for his choice but of tones allusions and of references and inferences of the voice the speaker of dialect is a master no range of phrases can be his but he has the more or the less confidential inflection until at times the close communication of the narrow street 
becomes a very conspiracy let it be borne in mind that dialect properly so called is something all unlike for instance the mere jargon of london streets the difference may be measured by the fact that italian dialects have a highly organized and orderly grammar the londoner cannot keep the small and loose order of the grammar of good english the genoese conjugates his patois verbs with subjunctives and all things of that handsome kind lacked by the english of universities the middle class the piccolo mondo the chairs italian dialect with the poor are more strictly local in their manners than either the opulent or the indigent of the same city they have moreover the busy intelligence which is the intellect of patois at its keenest their speech keeps them a sequestered place which is italian italian beyond the can of the traveller and beyond the reach of alteration and what is pretty to observe the speakers are well conscious of the characters of this intimate language an italian countryman who has known no other climate will vaunt in fervent platitudes his italian son in like manner he is conscious of the local character of his language and tucks himself within it at home whatever tuscan he may speak abroad a properly spelt letter swift said would seem to expose him and mrs dingley and stella to the eyes of the world but their little language ill written was snug lovers have made a little language in all times finding the nobler language insufficient do they ensconce themselves in the smaller discard noble and literary speech as not noble enough and in despair thus prattle and gibber and stammer rather perhaps this departure from english is but an excursion after gaiety the ideal lovers no doubt would be so simple as to be grave that is a tenable opinion nevertheless age by age they have been gay and age by age they have exchanged language imitated from the children they doubtless never studied and perhaps never loved why so they might have chosen broken english of other sorts that for example which was once thought amusing in farce as spoken by the frenchman conceived by the englishman a complication of humour fictitious enough one might think to please any one or else a fragment of negro dialect or the style of telegrams or the masterly adaptation of the simple savages english devised by mrs plornish in her intercourse with the italian but none of these found favour the choice has always been of the language of children let us suppose that the flock of winged loves worshipping venus in the titian picture and the noble child that rides his lion erect with a background of venetian gloomy dusk may be the inspirers of those prattlings see then thyself likewise art little maid says spencer's venus to her child swift was the best prattler he had caught the language surprised it in stella when she was veritably a child he did not push her clumsily back into a childhood he had not known he simply prolonged in her a childhood he had loved he is sepi night dealis d night dealis log it is a real good night it breathes tenderness from that moody and uneasy bed of projects End of chapter six Chapter 7 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maino. Chapter 7 Anima Pellegrina. Every language in the world has its own phrase, fresh for the stranger's fresh and alien sense of its signal significance a phrase that is its own essential possession and yet is dearer to the speakers of other tongues easily shall i say cheaply spiritual for example was the nation that devised the name anima pellegrina wherewith to crown a creature admired pilgrim soul is a phrase for any language but pilgrim soul addressed singly and sweetly to the one who cannot be overpraised 
pilgrim soul is a phrase of fondness the high homage of a lover of one watching of one who has no more need of common flatteries but has admired and gazed while the object of his praises visibly surpassed them this is the facile italian ecstasy and it rises into an italian heaven it was by chance and in an old play that i came upon this impetuous sudden and single sentence of admiration as it were a sentence of life passed upon one charged with inestimable deeds and the modern editor had thought it necessary to explain the exclamation by a note it was he said poetical anima pellegrina seems to be italian of no later date than pergolesi's airs and suits the time as the familiar phrase of the more modern love song suited the day of bellini but it is only italian bygone italian and not a part of the sweet past of any other european nation but only of this to the same local boundaries and enclosed skies belongs the charm of those buoyant words felice chi vi mira ma più felice chi per voi sospira and it is not only a charm of elastic sound or of grace that would be but a property of the turn of speech it is rather the profounder advantage whereby the rhymes are freighted with such feeling as the very language keeps in store in another tongue you may sing happy who looks happier who sighs but in what other tongue shall the little meaning be so sufficient and in what other shall you get from so weak an antithesis the illusion of a lovely intellectual epigram yet it is not worthy of an english reader to call it an illusion he should rather be glad to travel into the place of a language where the phrase is intellectual impassioned and an epigram and should thankful for the occasion translate himself and not the poetry i have been delighted to use a present current phrase whereof the charm may still be unknown to englishmen piuttosto brutini see what an all italian spirit is here and what contempt not reluctant but tolerant and familiar you may hear it said of pictures or of works of art of several kinds and you confess at once that not otherwise should they be condemned bruto ugly is the word of justice the word for any language everywhere translatable a circular note to be exchanged internationally with a general meaning wholesale in the course of the european concert but brutino is a soothing diminutive a diminutive that forbears to express contempt a diminutive that implies innocence and is moreover guarded by a hesitating adverb shrugging in the rear rather than not rather ugly than not and ugly in a little way that we need say few words about it the fewer the better nay this paraphrase cannot achieve the homely italian quality whereby the printed and condemnatory criticism is made a family affair that shall go no further after the sound of it the european concert seems to be composed of brass instruments how unlike is the house of english language in the enclosure into which a travel hither has to enter do we possess anything here more essentially ours though we share it with our sister germany than our particle un poor are those living languages that have not our use of so rich a negative the french equivalent in adjectives reaches no further than the adjective itself or hardly it does not attain the participle so that no french or italian poet has the words unloved unforgiven none such therefore has the opportunity of the gravest and the most majestic of all ironies in our english the words that are denied are still there loved forgiven excluded angels who stand erect attesting what is not done what is undone what shall not be done no merely opposite words could have so much denial or so much pain of loss or so much outer darkness or so much barred beatitude in sight all present all significant all remembering all foretelling is the word and it has a plentitude of knowledge we have many more conspicuous possessions that are like this proper to character and thought and by no means only an accident of untransferable speech and it is impossible for a reader who is a lover of languages for their spirit to pass the words of untravelled excellence proper to their own garden enclosed without recognition never may they be disregarded or confounded with the universal stock if i would not so neglect piuttosto brutini how much less a word dominating literature and of such words ascendancy and race there is no great english author but has abundant possession no need to recall them but even writers who are not great have here and there proved their full consciousness of their birthright thus does a man who was hardly an author hayden the painter put out his hand to take his rights he has incomparable language when he is at a certain page of his life at that time he sat down to sketch his child dying in its babyhood and the head he studied was he said full of power and grief this is a phrase of different discovery from that which reveals a local rhyme-based epigram a gracious antithesis taking an intellectual place felice chi vi mira or the art critic's phrase piuttosto brutini of easy companionable and equal contempt 
as for french if it had no other sacred words and it has many who would not treasure the language that has given us no not that has given us but that has kept for itself ensoleillé nowhere else is the sun served with such a word it is not to be said or written without a convincing sense of sunshine and from the very word come light and radiation the unaccustomed north could not have made it nor the accustomed south but only a nation part north and part south therefore neither england nor italy can rival it but there needed also the senses of the french those senses of which they say far too much in every second-class book of their enormous their general second-class but which they have matched in their time with some inimitable words perhaps that matching was done at the moment of the full literary consciousness of the senses somewhere about the famous eighteen thirty for i do not think ensoleilleux to be a much older word i make no assertion whatever its origin may it have no end they cannot weary us with it for it seems as new as the sun as remote as old provence village hillside vineyard and chestnut wood shine in the splendour of the word the air is light and white things passing blind the eyes a woman's linen white cattle shining on the way from shadow to shadow a word of the senses of sight and a summer word in short compared with which the paraphrase is but a picture for en soleil i would claim the consent of all readers that they shall all acknowledge the spirit of that french but perhaps it is a mere personal preference that makes le jour s'annonce also sacred but if the hymn sabbat mater dolorosa was written in latin this could be only that it might in time find its true language and incomparable phrase at last that it might await the day of life in its proper german i found it there and knew at once the authentic verse and knew at once for what tongue it had really been destined in the pages of the prayer book of an apple woman at an innsbruck church and in the accents of her voice End of chapter 7、Chapter 8 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynall. Chapter 8 The Sea Wall. A singular love of walls is mine, perhaps because of childish association with mountain climbing roads narrow in the bright shadows of grey stone, hiding olive trees whereof the topmost leaves prick above into the blue, or perhaps because of subsequent living in London, with its too many windows and too few walls, the city which of all capitals takes least visible hold upon the ground. Or for the sake of some other attraction or aversion, walls, blank and strong, reaching outward at the base, are a satisfaction to the eyes teased by the inexpressive peering of windows, by that weak lapse and shuffling which is the London area, and by the helpless hollows of shop fronts. I would rather have a wall than any rail, but a very good one of wrought iron. A wall is the safeguard of simplicity, it lays a long level line among the indefinite chances of the landscape. But never more majestic than in the face of the wild sea, the wall, steadying its slanting foot upon the rock, builds in the serried ilex wood and builds out of the wave. The sea wall is the wall at its best, and fine as it is on the strong coast, it is beautiful on the weak littoral and the imperiled levels of a northern beach. That sea wall is low and long. Sea pinks grow on the salt grass that passes away into shingle at its foot. It is at close quarters with the winter sea when, from the low coast with its low horizon, the skyline of sea is jagged. Never from any height does the ocean horizon show thus broken and battered at its very verge, but from the flat coast in the narrow world you can see the wave as far as you can see the water, and the stormy light of a clear horizon is to be seen mobile and shifting with the buoyant hillocks in their restless line. Nowhere in Holland does there seem to be such a low sea wall as secures many a mile of gentle English coast to the east. The Dutch dyke has not that aspect of a lowly parapet against a tide. It springs with a look of haste and of height, and when you first run upstairs from the encumbered Dutch fields to look at the sea, there is nothing in the least like England. And even the Englishman of today is apt to share something of the old perversity that was minded to cast derision upon the Dutch in their encounters with the tides. There has been some fault in the Dutch, making them subject to the slight derision of the nations who hold themselves to be more romantic and, as it were, more slender. We English, once upon a time, did especially flout the little nation, then acting a history that proved worth the writing. It may be no more than a brief perversity that has set a number of our writers to cheer the memory of Charles the Second. Perhaps, even, it is no more than another rehearsal of that untiring success at the expense of the bourgeois. 
the bourgeois would be more simple than in fact he is were he to stand up every time to be shocked but perhaps the image of his dismay is enough to reward the fancy of those who practise the wanton art and when all is done who performs for any but an imaginary audience surely those companies of spectators and auditors are not the least the makings of an author a few men and women he achieves within his books but others does he create without and to those figures of all illusion makes the appeal of his art more candid is the author who has no world but turns that appeal inward to his own heart he has at least a living hearer this is by the way charles the second has been cheered the feat is done the dismay is imagined with joy and yet the merry monarchs was a dismal time plague fire the arrears of pension from the french king remembered and claimed by the restored throne of england and the dutch in the medway all this was disaster none the less having the vanity of new clothes and a pretty figure did we especially by the mouth of andrew marvel deride our victors making sport of the philistines with a proper national sense of enjoyment of such physical disabilities or such natural difficulties or such misfavour of fortune as may beset the alien especially were the denials of fortune matter for merriment they are so still or they were so certainly in the day when a great novelist found the smallness of some south german states to be the subject of unsating banter the german scenes at the end of vanity fair for example may prove how much the ridicule of mere smallness fewness poverty and not even real poverty privation but the poverty that shows in comparison with the gold of great states and is properly in proportion rejoiced the sense of humour in a writer and moralist who intended to teach mankind to be less worldly in andrew marvel's day they were even more candid the poverty of privation itself was provocative of the sincere laughter of the inmost man the true infrequent laughter of the heart marvel the puritan laughed at that very laughter at leanness at hunger cold and solitude in the face of the world and in the name of literature in one memorable satire i speak of flenco an english priest in rome wherein nothing is spared not the smallness of the lodging nor the lack of a bed nor the scantiness of clothing nor the fast quote, this basso relievo of a man end quote, personal meagerness is the first joke and the last it is not to be wondered that he should find in the smallness of the country of holland matter for cordial jest but besides the smallness there was that accidental and natural disadvantage in regard to the sea in the venetians commerce with the sea conflict with the sea a victory over the sea and the ensuing peace albeit a less instant battle and a more languid victory were confessed to be noble in the dutch they were grotesque with mad labor says andrew marvel with the spirited consciousness of the citizen of a country well above ground and free to watch the labor at leisure with mad labor did the dutch fish the land to shore how did they rivet with gigantic piles through the centre their new catched miles and to the stake a struggling country bound where barking waves still bait the forced ground building their watery babel far more high to reach the sea than those to scale the sky it is done with a jolly wit and what admirable couplets Quote, the fish oft times the burger dispossessed and sat not as a meat but as a guest and it is even better sport that the astonished tritons and the sea nymphs should find themselves provided with a capital cabalau of shoals and pickled dutchmen herein for herring says marvel and it must be allowed that he rhymes with the enjoyment of irony there is not a smile for us in flecno but it is more than possible to smile over this character of holland at the excluded ocean returning to play at leapfrog over the steeples at the rise of government and authority in holland which belonged of right to the man who could best invent a shovel or a pump the sky being so leaky Quote, not who first sees the rising sun commands but who could first discern the rising lands we have lost something more than the delighted laughter of marvel more than his practical joke and more than the heart that was so light and so burly a frame we have lost with these the wild humour that wore so well the bonds of two equal lines and was wild with so much older invention malice gaiety polish equilibrium and vitality in a word the couplet the couplet of the past we who cannot stand firm within two lines must slip beyond and between the boundaries who tolerate the couplets of keats and imitate them should praise the day of charles the second because of marvel's art and not for love of the sorry rain we had plague and fire in the dutch medway but we had the couplet and there were also the measures of those more poetic poets hitherto called somewhat slightingly the cavalier poets who matched the wit of the puritan with a spirit simpler and less mocking it was against an english fortress profoundly walled that some remembered winter storms lately turned their great artillery 
It was a time of resounding nights. The sky was so clamorous and so close up in the towers of the seaside stronghold that one seemed to be indeed admitted to the perturbed counsels of the winds. The gale came with an indescribable haste, hooting as it flew. It seemed to break itself upon the heights, yet passed unbroken out to sea. In the voice of the sea there were pauses, but none of that in the urgent gale with its hoo-hoo-hoo all night that clamored down the calling of the waves. That lack of pauses was the strangest thing in the tempest, because the increase of sound seemed to imply a lull before. The lull was never perceptible, but the lift was always an alarm. The onslaught was instant. Where would it stop? What was the secret extreme to which this hurry and force were tending? You asked less what thing was driving the flocks of the storm than what was drawing them. The attraction seemed the greater violence, the more irresistible and the more unknown and there were moments when the end seemed about to be attained. The wind struck us hasty blows, and unaware as we borrowed, to describe it, words fit for the sharp strokes of material things. But the fierce gale is soft. Along the shore grass, trembling and cowering flat on the scraped hillside, against the staggering horse, against the flint walls, one with the rock they grasp, the battery of the tempest is a quick and enormous softness. What down, what sand, what deep moss, what elastic wave could match the bed and cushion of the gale? The storm tossed the wave and the stones of the sea wall up together. The next day it left the waters white with the thrilling whiteness of foam and sunshine. It was only the channel, and in such narrow waters you do not see the distances, the wide levels of fleeting and floating foam that lie between long wave and long wave on a Mediterranean coast, regions of delicate and transitory brightness so far out that all the waves near and far, seemed to be breaking at the same moment, one beyond the other and league beyond league into foam. But the channel has its own strong, short curl that catches the rushing shingle up with the freshest of all noises and runs up with sudden curves, white upon the seawall, under the random shadow of seagulls and the light of a shining cloud. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Chapter 9 The Daffodil. To travel eastwards and breast the sun, to sail towards the watershed and breast the floods, to go north and breast the winter. Fresh and warm are the energies of such bracing action, but more animating still is it to live so as to breast the stress of time. Man and woman may, like the child, or almost like him, fill the time and enlarge the capacity of the day, our poor day that so easily shrinks and dwindles in the careless possession of idle minds. The date, every first of March, for example, may sweep upon a large curve and come home annually after a swinging flight. To the infinite variety of natural days may be entrusted half the work of strengthening the flight against time, but the other half must be the task of the vehement heart. Nature assuredly does not fail. Days, seasons, and years are as wide asunder as the unforeseen can set them, and a crowd of children is not more various. But the resisting heart seems of late to be somewhat lacking. We are inclined to turn our heel upon the east, upon the watershed, upon the gates of the wind, and go to the smooth road. We are even precipitate, and whip our way faster on the time-killing course than the natural event would take us. It is not enough that we should run helplessly. We outstrip the breeze and outsail the current with the ease of our untimely luxuries. Our daffodils are no longer to have the praise of their daring, for we no longer relate them to the lagging swallow. By the time the barely budding woods give a poor man's lodging to the cold daffodil, a scanty kind, taking the wind with a short stalk and giving it but small petals to buffet, we have already said farewell to the tall and splendid greenhouse daffodil that never braved the cold. We gave to this our untimely welcome long before the snowdrop came, and the golden name of the daffodil has lost its vernal sound. And when we part with the improved creature, lofty and enlarged, we hardly know or care whether the starveling is yet mustering in hollows of woodlands, or whether it is over or to come. We are attending to a yellow or a tulip, no doubt, when the only daffodil that Shakespeare knew is opening in the chilly wood. The reproach is a commonplace, 
but perhaps we have generally accused ourselves of the impatience rather than of the listlessness and have not noted how we shorten the disarranged seasons and lay up for ourselves memories confused and undefined late springs and early gentle and hard are compelled to yield to the same colors haste has its way in its revenges if we are resolved to live quickly why nothing is easier there are no such brief days as those that are indistinct and the sliding on the way of time is of all habits the most tyrannously careless it is first a laxity then a habit and next a folly and when we keep neither ash wednesday nor the birthday of daffodils and have hardly felt the cold and do not know where the sun rises we are already on the way of least resistance the friction of life is gone and in our last old age the past will seem to dwindle even like the dwindled present of our decline there has been one unconscious operation of the love of life one single grasp after variety intended to save the year to face it to meet it to compel it to show a unique face and bear a name of its own and this is travel it is the finest and most effectual flight against time of all what elastic days are those wherein i make a head against a travelling landscape meet histories and boundaries hail frontiers face a new manner of building cross the regions of silver roofs and heavy alpine stone and bring with me the late light upon billowy gables and red eaves and how buoyant the week in which i anticipate the sun upon the roofless east how serried are the days with forests how enlarged by plains how thronged by cities how singled by the pine how newly audible by a new sea far was the sunrise from the sunset and noon is one memorable midday with shortened shadows upon some solitary road our fathers had friction of another kind hardship at home winters and nights that were dark with the darkness we have abolished springs that brought an infinite releasing illumination and recoloring none of us has seen the sight or breathed the air or heard these emancipated voices the bloom the birds the lifted sky bright nights and glowing houses have surely robbed us of that variety and all these untimely fruits and flowers have suppressed even the small privations of a winter in disguise in those days englishmen had to breast the times as they were they had the privilege of their latitude vigorous and rigorous seasons they had a year full of change their time was stretched whether with impatience or with patience with conflict or with felicity their salt meats were not the worst of it there was the siege of darkness the captivity of cold the threat of storm and the labor to close with the closing enemy to break ways and save animals alive and keep the laws in force in the street in the long and secret nights from such a season of winter at home winter well known men broke free to hail their daffodils they found them short strong and shivering in the still open and undefended woods in the springs before chaucer and earlier than the day of the first spring lyric in the same places grew the keen wild flowers as now but they assuredly were marked with another welcome they made memories this year's wild harvest was not confused with that of last year or of half a score of years gone by distance of vital time set the springs far apart and made the daffodils strangers they were greeted with the courtesy due to strangers so fresh must have been the senses of the villager and of the citizen of the village town suburbs divide a city from the fields as walls did never he of old went from a little town close and serried as a new box of toys with one step into the unsmirched country carrying an unsated heart refreshed with the animating compulsion of a changeful life were man and woman and much like their child in a constant capacity for unique experiences unique days years that are separate known and distinguishable and not only separate but long indeed some of us who travel hardly know how to remedy our fugitive resembling hastening and collapsing seasons even by means of this sovereign remedy of travel it is to be feared that a modern journey is not always to us so bracing a manner of living as was the untravelled journey of hard days at home to the ancient islander to journey as he did keeping his feet with a moving heart against the moving seasons to resist to withstand widened the hours but his posterity are taking all means to narrow their own even on the railway to go the same way every year for instance is to lose when a few such years are gone nearly all the gain to life to take no heed at all of the way but merely to be by any means at the end of the travelling to sleep or to go by night and to calculate europe by hours half hours junctions and dining cars is but to close up the time as though you closed a telescope a long railway journey and a long motor journey may be taken with the flight of time as well as against it 
and the habits of summaries can use these too to its own end precipitate unresisting are the day and the train and the heedless night we love to reproach ourselves with living at too great a speed having perhaps no sense of the second meaning of the phrase medicine may perhaps fulfil her promise of giving us a few more years but habit derides her by making each year a scanty gift much too of the spirit of time is lost to us because we will not let the sun rule the day he would see to it that our hours were various but we have preferred to his various face the plain face of a clock and the lights without vicissitudes of our nights without seasons end of chapter nine chapter ten of series runaway and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Chapter 10. Addresses. Not free from some ignominious attendance upon the opinion of the world is he who too consciously withdraws his affairs from its judgments. He is indebted to the public. He is at least indebted to it for the fact that there is, yonder, without, a public. Lacking this excluded multitude, his fastidiousness would have no subject and his singularity no contrast he would in his grosser moods have nothing to refuse and nothing in his finer to ignore he at any rate is one and the rest are numerous they minister to him popular errors but if they are nothing else in regard to himself they are many if he must have distinction it is there on easy terms he is one well for him if he does not contract the heavier debt shouldered by the man who owes to the unknown unnamed and unaccounted his pleasure in their conjectured or implicit envy who conceives the jealousy they may have covertly to endure enjoys it and thus silently begins and ends within his own morosity the story of his base advantage vanity has indignity as its underside and how shall even the pleasure in beauty be altogether without it for since beauty like other human things is comparative how shall the praise or the admiration thereof be free from at least some reference to the unbeautiful or from some allusion to the less beautiful yet this if inevitable is little it may be negligible the triumph of beauty is all but innocent it is where no beauty is in question that lurks the unconfessed appeal to envy that appeal is not an appeal to admiration it lacks what is the genial part of egoism for who except perhaps a recent writer of articles on society in america really admires a man for living in the approved part of boston the vanity of addresses is as frequent with us on the western side of the atlantic it is a vanity without that single apology for vanity gaiety of heart the first things that are in london sacrificed to it are the beautiful day and the facing of the sky there are some amongst us whose wives have constrained them to dwell underground for love of an address modern and foolish is that contempt for daylight to the simple day is beautiful and beautiful as day a happy proverb over all color flesh aspect surface manifestation of vitality dwells one certain dominance and if one vigilant for the dues of his vicegerent should ask us whose is the image in superscription we reply the sun's the london air shortens and clips those beams and yet leaves daylight the finest thing we know beauty of artificial lights is in our streets at night but their chief beauty is when just before night they adorn the day the late daylight honors them when it so easily and sweetly subdues and overcomes them giving to the electric lamp to the taper to the hearth fire and to the spark a loveliness not their own with the unpublished desire to be envied whereto here and there amongst us is sacrificed the sky abides the desire for an object of unconfessed contempt both are contrary to that more authentic that essential solitariness wherein a few men have the grace to live and wherein all men are compelled to die both are unpublished even now even in our days when it costs men so little to manifest the effrontery of their opinions the difference between our worldliness and the new worldliness is chiefly that we are apt to remove by a little space the distinction brought about by riches to put it back to interpose between it and our actual life a generation or two an education or two obviously it was riches that made the class differences if not now then a little time ago therefore the new england citizen should not be reproved by us for anything except his too great candor a social guide-book to some city of the republic is in my hands i note how the very names of the streets take a sound of veneration or of cheerful derision from the writer's pen 
it is evident that the names are almost enough they have an expression he is like a naive teller of humorous antidotes who cannot keep his own smiles in order till he have done this social writer has scorn as an author should and he wrecks it upon parishes he turns me a phrase with the northern end of a town and makes an epigram of the southern he caps a sarcasm with an address in truth we too might write social guidebooks to the same effect had we the same simplicity it is to be thought that we too hold an address be it a good one so closely that if fortune should see fit to snatch it from us she must needs do so with violence such unseemly violence in this as in other transactions is ours in the clinging and not hers in the taking for equal is the force of fortune and steady is her grasp whether she despoil the great of their noble things or strip the mean of things ignoble whether she takes from the clutching or the yielding hand strange are the little traps laid by the londoner so as to capture an address by the hem if he may you would think a good address to be of all blessings the most stationary and one to be either gained or missed and no two ways about it but not so you shall see it waylaid at the angles of squares with no slight exercise of skill delayed entreated detained entangled intricately caught persuaded to round a corner prolonged beyond all probability pursued one address there will in the future be for us and few will visit there it will bear the number of a narrow house may it avow its poverty and be poor for the obscure inhabitant in frigid humility shall have no thought nor eye askance upon the multitude End of chapter 10chapter 11 of circe's runaway and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by annie hill circe's runaway and other essays by alice maynell chapter 11 the audience the long laugh that sometimes keeps the business of the stage waiting is only a sign of the exchange of parts that in the theatre every night takes place the audience are the players their audience on the stage are bound to watch them to understand them to anticipate them and to divine them but once known and their character established in relation to a particular play the audience what is called the audience need give no further trouble they themselves cannot alter they are fixed and compelled by the tremendous force of averages the most inexorable of laws and the most irresistible of necessities are upon them and they cannot do otherwise they are out of reach of accidents they are made fast in their own mediocrity they are a thousand london people and no genius or no imbecility amongst them has any effect upon that secure sovereignty of a number the long laugh generally means that the house by its unalterable majority has laughed at one joke three times the stage waits upon the audience and the audience rehearses its collective and inevitable laugh it performs it communicates itself and art is a communication a small and chosen party is made up behind the footlights to see a thousand people given helpless into the hands of destiny and subject to averages so express themselves the audience's audience the people on the stage are persuaded into applauding the laugh too long and too often the author is of course one of them and he applauds by making too many such translations they are perhaps worth making and even worth renewing in acknowledgment of a smile but it is surely to encourage the house unduly to make them so important the actors applaud their audience by repeating and not once or only twice a piece of comic business does the average laugh so well as indeed to deserve all this the average does little more than laugh it knows that its own truest talents are indubitably comic we have no real tragic audiences this is no expression of regret over legitimate audiences or audiences of the old school or any audiences of that kind whose day may or may not have had a date it is a mere statement of the fact that audiences have lost 
or never had a distinguishing perception of emotion whereas they have every kind of perception of humour distinguishing and general their laugh never fails if their friends behind would really care to improve them it might be done by exacting from them a little more temperance in their sense of comedy we shall never have a really good school of audience without the exercise of some such severity for obviously when we call an average unchangeable we mean that it is unchangeable for its time merely there might be a slow upraising of the level it would still be a level and there would still be a compelling law upon one thousand that it should do the same thing as another thousand but that same thing might become somewhat more intelligent when a fine actor does a fine thing have we such a school of audience as to merit this admirable supply to their demands this applause of their understanding is there not in the whole excellent piece of work something all too independent of their part in the theatre if caligula wished that mankind had but one neck for his knife and byron that all womankind had but one mouth for his kiss so the audience has conceived that all arts should have but one mystery for its blundering and thus thinks itself interested in acting when it does but admire the actors as in a drawing the time may come when a national school of dramatic audience shall not accept artifices that could not convince the fool amongst them when one brilliant moment of simplicity on the one side of the footlights shall meet a brilliant simplicity on the other which troop which side to begin end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Chapter Twelve. Tithonus. It was resolved, said the morning paper, to color the borders of the panels and other spaces of Portland stone with arabesques and other patterns but that no paint should be used, as paint would need renewing from time to time. The colors, therefore, and here is the passage to be noted, are all mixed with wax liquefied with petroleum, and the wax surface sets as hard as marble. The wax is left time to form an imperishable surface of ornament, which would have to be cut out of the stone with a chisel if it was desired to remove it not apparently that a new surface is formed which by much violence and perseverance could years hence be chipped off again but that the ornament is driven in and incorporate burn in and absorbed so that there is nothing possible to cut away by any industry in this humorous form of ornament we are beforehand with posterity posterity is baffled will this victory over our sons sons be the last resolute tyranny prepared by one age for the coercion constraint and defeat of the future to impose that compulsion has been hitherto one of the strongest of human desires it is one doubtless to be outgrown by the human race but how slowly that growth creeps onwards let this success in the stenciling of st paul's teach us to our confusion there is evidently a man a group of men happy at this moment because it has been possible by great ingenuity to force our posterity to have their cupola of st paul's with the stone moulding stenciled and picked out with niggling colours whether that undefended posterity like it or not and this is a survival of one of the obscure pleasures of man attested by history it is impossible to read the thirty-nine articles for example and not to recognise in those acts of final all resolute eager eternal legislation one of the strongest of all recorded proofs of this former human wish if galileo's inquisitors put a check upon the earth which yet moved a far bolder enterprise was the reformers who arrested the moving man and inhibited the moving god the sixteenth century and a certain part of the age immediately following seemed to be times when the desire had conspicuously become a passion say the middle of the sixteenth century in italy and the beginning of the seventeenth in england for in those days we were somewhat in the rear 
there is the obstinate confident unreluctant undoubting and resolved seizure upon power then was rome rebuilt resurfaced marked with a single sign and style then was many a human hand stretched forth to grasp the fate of the unborn the fortunes and the thoughts of the day to come were to be as the day then present would have them if the dead hand the living hand that was then to die and was to keep its hold in death could by any means make them fast obviously to build it all is to impose something upon an age that may be more than willing to build for itself the day may soon come when no man will do even so much without some impulse of apology posterity is not compelled to keep our pictures or our books in existence nor to read nor to look at them but it is more or less obliged to have a stone building in view for an age or two we can hardly avoid some of the forms of tyranny over the future but few few are the living men who would consent to share in this horrible ingenuity at st paul's this petroleum and this wax in 1842 they were discussing the decoration of the houses of parliament and the efforts of all in council were directed upon the future how the frescoes then to be achieved by the artist of the day should be made secure against all mischances smoke damp the risk of bulging even accidents attending the washing of upper floors all was discussed in confidence with the public it was impossible for any one who read the papers then to escape from some at least of the responsibilities of technical knowledge from genoa from rome from munich especially all kinds of expert and most deliberate schemes were gathered in order to defeat the natural and not superfluous operation of efficient and effacing time the academic little capital of bavaria had at about the same date decorated a vast quantity of wall space of more than one order of architecture art revived and was encouraged at that time in place with unparalleled obstinacy they had not the malice of the petroleum that does violence to st paul's but they had instead an indomitable patience under the commands of the master cornelius they baffled time and all his work refused his pardons his absolutions his cancelling indulgences by a perseverance that nothing could discourage who has not known somewhat indifferent painters mighty busy about their colours and varnishes cornelius caused a pit to be dug for the preparation of the lime and in the case of the ludwig kirk this lime remained there for eight years with frequent stirrings this was in order that the whole fresco when at last it was entrusted to its bed should be set there for immortality nor did the master fail to thwart time by those mechanical means that should avert the risk of bulging already mentioned he neglected no detail he was provident and he lay in wait for more than one of the laws of nature to frustrate them gravitation found him prepared and so did the less majestic but not vain dispensation of accidents against bulging he had an underplot of tile set on end against possible trickling from an upper floor he had asphalt it was all part of the human conspiracy in effect the dull pictures at munich seemed to stand well it would have been more just so the present age thinks of these preserved walls if the day that admired them had had them exclusively and our day had been exempt the painted cathedrals of the middle ages have undergone the natural correction why not the ludwig kirk in eighteen forty two then the nations were standing as it were shoulder to shoulder against the walk of time and against his gentle act and art they had just called iron into their cabal cornelius came from munich to london looked at the walls at westminster and put a heart of confidence into the breast of the commission the situation he averred need not be too damp for immortality with due care what he had done in the glyptothek and in the pinacothek might be done with the best results in england in defiance of the weather of the river of the mere days of the divine order of alteration and in a word of heaven and earth meanwhile there was that good servant of the law of change lime that had not been kept quite long enough ready to fulfil its mission they would have none of it they evaded it studied its ways and put it to the rout many failures that might have been hastily attributed to damp were really owing to the use of lime in too fresh a state of the experimental works painted at munich those only have faded which are known to have been done without due attention to materials thus a figure of bavaria painted by kalbach which has faded considerably 
is known to have been executed with lime that was too fresh. One cannot refrain from italics. The way was so easy. It was only to take a little less of this important care about the lime to have a better confidence, to be more impatient and eager, and all to have been well. Not to do. A virtue of omission. This is not a matter of art criticism. It is an ethical question hitherto unstudied. The makers of laws have not always been obliged to face it inasmuch as their laws are made in part for the present, and in part for that future whereof the present needs to be assured. That is, the future is bound as a guarantee for present security of person or property. Some such hold upon the time to come we are obliged to claim, and to claim it for our own sakes, because of the reflex effect upon our own affairs, and not for the pleasure of fettering the time to come. Every maker of a will does at least this. Were the men of the sixteenth century so moderate? Not they. They found the present all too narrow for the imposition of their will. It did not satisfy them to disinter and scatter the bones of the dead, nor to efface the records of a past that offended them. It did not satisfy them to bind the present to obedience by imperative menace and instant compulsion. When they had burnt libraries and thrown down monuments and pursued the rebels of the past into the other world, and had seen to it that none living should evade them, then they outraged the future. Whatever misgivings may have visited those dominant minds as to the effectual and final success of their measures, would their writ run in time as well as place, and were the nameless populations indeed their subjects? Whatever questions may have peered in upon those rigid councils and upon those busy vigils of the keepers of the world, they silenced by legislation and yet more legislation. They wrote in statute books. They would have written their will across the skies. Their hearts would have burnt for lack of records more inveterate and of testimonials that mankind should lack courage to question, if in truth they did ever doubt lest posterity might try their lock. Perhaps they did never so much as foresee the race of the unnumbered and emancipated for whom their prohibitions and penalties are no more than documents of history. If the tyrannous day of our fathers had but possessed the means of these are more diffident times. They who would have written their present and actual will upon the skies might certainly have written it in petroleum and wax upon the stone. Fate did them wrong in withholding from their hands this means of finality and violence. Into our hands it has been given at a time when the student of the race thought, perhaps, that we had been proved in the school of forbearance. Something indeed we may have learnt therein, but not enough, as we now find. We have not yet the natural respect for the certain knowledge and the probable wisdom of our successors. A certain reverend official document, not guiltless of some confusion of thought, lately recommended to the veneration of the present times, those past ages with their store of experience. Doubtless, as the posterity of their predecessors, our predecessors had experience. But as our ancestors, none. None. Therefore, if they were a little reverend, our own posterity is right reverend. It is a flippant and novelty-loving humor that so flatters the unpassed and refuses the deference due to the burden of years which is ours, which grown still graver, will be our children's. End of chapter 12. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 13 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Mayno The Towpath A childish pleasure in producing small mechanical effects unaided must have some part in the sense of enterprise wherewith you gird your shoulders with a tackle and set out alone but necessary on the even path of the lopped and grassy side of the thames the side of meadows the elastic resistance of the line is a heart animating strain only too slight and sensible is the thrill in it 
as the ranks of the riverside plants or their small summit flower of violet pink are swept aside like a long green breaker of flourishing green the line drums lightly in the ears when the bushes are high and it grows taut it makes a telephone for the rush of flowers under the stress of your easy power the active delights of one who is not athletic are few like the joys of feeling hearts according to the erroneous sentiment of a verse of moore's the joys of sensitive hearts are many but the joys of sensitive hands are few here however in the effectual act of towing is the ample revenge of the unmuscular upon the happy laborers with the oar the pole the bicycle and all other means of violence here on the long towpath between warm and brown meadows and opal waters you need but to walk in your swinging harness and so take your friends upstream you work merely as the millstream works by simple movement at lock after lock along a hundred miles deep roofed mills shake to the wheel that turns by no greater stress and you in the river have the same mere force of progress there never was any kinder incentive of companionship it is the bright thames walking softly in your blood or you that are flowing by so many curves of low shore on the level of the world now you are over against the shadows and now opposite the sun as the wheeling river makes the sky wheel about your head and swings the lighted clouds or the blue to face your eyes the birds flying high from mountain air in the heat wing nothing but their own weight you will not envy them for so brief a success did not wordsworth want a little boat for the air did not byron call him a blockhead therefore wordsworth had perhaps a sense of towing all the advantage of the expert is nothing in this simple industry even the athlete though he may go further cannot do better than you walking your effectual walk with a line attached to your willing steps your moderate strength of a mere everyday physical education gives you the sufficient mastery of the towpath if your natural walk is heavy there is spirit in the tackle to give it life and if it is buoyant it will be more buoyant under the buoyant burden the yielding check than ever before an unharnessed walk must begin to seem to you a sorry incident of insignificant liberty it is easier than towing so is the drawing of water in a sieve easier to the arms than drawing in a bucket but not to the heart to walk unbound is to walk in prose without the friction of the wings of meter without the sweet and encouraging tug upon the spirit and the line no dead weight follows you as you tow the burden is willing it depends upon you gaily as a friend may do without making any depressing show of helplessness neither on the other hand is it apt to set you at naught or charge you with the make-believe it accompanies it almost anticipates it lags when you are brisk just so much as to give your briskness good reason and to justify you if you should take to still more nimble heels all your haste moreover does but waken a more brilliantly sounding ripple the bounding and rebounding burden you carry but it nearly seems to carry you so fine is the mutual good will gives work to your figure enlists your erectness and your gait but leaves your eyes free no watching of mechanisms for the labor of the towpath what little outlook is to be kept falls to the lot of the steerer smoothly towed your easy and efficient work let you carry your head high and watch the birds or listen to them 
They fly in such lofty air that they seem to turn blue in the blue sky. A flash of their flight shows silver for a moment, but they are bluebirds in that sunny distance above, as mountains are blue and horizons. The days are so still that you do not merely hear the cawing of the rooks, you overhear their hundred private croakings and creakings the soliloquy of the solitary places swept by wings. As for songs, it is September, and the silence of July is long at an end. This year's robins are in full voice, and the only song that is not for love or nesting, the childish song of boy birds, the freshest and youngest note, is, by happy paradox, that of an autumnal voice. Here is no hoot, nor hurry of engines, nor whisper of the cyclist's wheel, nor foot upon a road, to overcome that light but resounding note. Silent are feet on the grassy brink, like the innocent, stealthy souls of the barefooted in the south. End of chapter 13chapter 14 of series runaway and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo series runaway and other essays by alice mayno the Tethered Constellations It is no small thing, no light discovery, to find a river Andromeda and Arcturus and their bright neighbors wheeling for half a summer night around a pole star in the waters. One star or two, delicate visitants of streams, we are used to see, somewhat by a slight of the eyes, so fine and so fleeting is that apparition. Where the southern waves may show the light, not the image, of the evening or the morning planet. But this, in a pool of the country Thames at night, is no ripple-lengthened light. It is the startling image of a whole large constellation burning in the flood. These reflected heavens are different heavens. On a darker and more vacant field than that of the real skies, the shape of the lyre or the bear has an altogether new and noble solitude, and the waters play a painter's part in setting their splendid subject free. Two movements shake, but do not scatter the still night. The bright flashing of constellations in the deep weir pool and the dark flashes of the vague bats flying. The stars in the stream fluctuate with an alien motion. Reversed, estranged, isolated, every shape of large stars escapes and returns, escapes and returns. Fitful in the steady night, those constellations, so few, so whole, and so remote, have a suddenness of gleaming life. You imagine that some unexampled gale might make them seem to shine with such a movement in the veritable sky. Yet nothing but deep water, seeming still in its incessant flight and rebound, could really show such altered stars. The flood lets a constellation fly, as Juliet's wanton with a tethered bird, only to pluck it home again. At moments, some rhythmic flux of the water seems about to leave the darkly set, widely spaced bear absolutely at large, to dismiss the great stars, and refuse to imitate the skies, and all the waters obscure. Then one broken star returns, then fragments of another, and a third and a fourth flit back to their noble places, 
brilliantly vague, wonderfully visible, mobile, and unalterable. There is nothing else at once so keen and so elusive. The Aspen Poplar had been in captive flight all day, but with no such vanishings as these. The dimmer constellations of the soft night are reserved by the skies. Hardly is a secondary star seen by the large and vague eyes of the stream. They are blind to the Pleiades. There is a little kind of star that drowns itself by hundreds in the river Thames, the many-rayed silver-white seed that makes journeys on all the winds up and down England and across it in the end of summer. It is a most expert traveler, turning a little wheel at tiptoe wherever the wind lets it rest, and speeding on those pretty points when it is not flying. The streets of London are among its many highways, for it is fragile enough to go far in all sorts of weather. But it gets disabled if a rough gust tumbles it on the water, so that its finely feathered feet are wet. On gentle breezes it is able to cross dry shod, walking the waters. All unlike is this pilgrim star to the tethered constellations. It is far adrift. It goes singly to all the winds. It offers thistle plants, or whatever is the flower that makes such delicate ashes, to the tops of many thousand hills. Doubtless, the farmer would rather have to meet it in battalions than in these invincible units astray. But if the farmer owes it a lawful grudge, there is many a rigid riverside garden wherein it would be a great pleasure to sow the thistles of the nearest pasture. End of chapter 2